if the housing market does better than the stock market, then wealth inequality in the economy falls. Mainly because the middle class, which has so much housing in its portfolio, does relatively better, has larger wealth gains than the top 10% or even the top 5 or top 1% whose wealth is concentrated in business equity. If, however, the stock market does better than the housing market, then wealth inequality almost mechanically rises. And that's what we've seen in the past decade. Generally speaking, the stock market has done very well, and that has boosted the wealth of the top 10% in a way that we haven't seen before in American, uh, modern American economic history. Hi, I'm Moritz Rilarik. I'm a professor at the University of Bonn and a fellow of INET, and I work on macrofinance. I think the question that we're debating in, in, in the field right now is what were really the deeper causes? I think we have a pretty good understanding of the role of subprime mortgages, of repackaging of instruments. We also have a good idea about sort of liquidity needs and the shadow banking sector. But I think the real question we still haven't answered. And the real question is what were sort of the deeper drivers for, these ex for this excessive risk taking that we've seen in, in the financial system, broadly speaking? The two different ways to look at it. The first is, oh, this has all to do with incentives. It's that bankers, they don't have enough skin in the game, and uh, that drives them to take bets that are excessive. Because if things go well, they all make a lot of money, and if things go badly, then society picks up the bill. That's one view. And if that's the correct view, what's like driving excessive risk taking, not only in before 2008, but generally speaking in modern economic history, in the times leading up to these crises, then sort of the remedy is pretty clear. We must make sure that bankers have more skin in the game. We would increase capital ratios in the banking system to make sure that the people who act also have to stand in with their own money for the losses they take. I think that's, it's fair to say that's like the traditional view. There's a second view, and I think it's gaining in importance, and it has to do with the idea that maybe bankers make mistakes, but maybe, maybe they're not quite as evil as we think they are. Maybe they get also caught in the same euphoria, in the same bubble mentality as other people do. Maybe they really don't, they don't set out to risk their bangs. Maybe they're just convinced, just as many other people, that the housing market was a great investment. And just as the stock market and investors in the stock market rewarded bankers for you know, going into the housing market, extending all these mortgages. So maybe, you know, the other view would be one where the actors in the financial system are as susceptible to making mistakes and form expectations about the future in a way that might not be rational uh, as everyone else. And if you read, like, the old books by Kindleberger, by Minsky, that's kind of the idea they have, is that the financial sector, the people acting there, you know, extrapolate information they have, they form forecasts that might be biased, they get over-optimistic, just as everyone else. And a few recent contributions have, I think, made that point. This is important because if you think about how to regulate the financial sector, a central idea we have is that discipline, that the market will discipline um, agents in the financial sector. But if the market and the actors in the financial system, they make the same mistakes, if they're all too optimistic at times and too pessimistic maybe at other times, then that whole idea of market discipline doesn't work anymore. The traditional view is that the more skin in the game the banker has, the more safer she or he will act. And there's nothing, like, nothing wrong with that idea. The question is if that really prevents the buildup of excessive risk that we see in the run-up to financial crisis. And I would be skeptical. Based on our recent research where we analyze the link between capital ratios and crisis probability over a very long period and over a long, uh, a, a broad uh, country sample, is that essentially capital ratios and the risk of financial crisis are not correlated. There is no link. We also go a little further and argue that very likely there's just no causal link. And the reason might well be that bankers and you know, actors in the financial system um, make the same behavioral mistakes that other people make. They're also too optimistic about the uh, outlook for, say, the housing market, the real estate market, and they make decisions based on these too optimistic forecasts. I think one example that, that really gets to the point is to say, well, 
there are also markets in which there's no problem, capital ratios are 100%, and in these markets too, we see repeated mispricings, booms and busts, spectacular bubbles that burst. It's called the equity market. The equity market is a 100% equity market, and in these markets too, we see these phenomena. So the idea of saying like, all the problems we see, everything that's driving the probability of a financial crisis, of financial instability, has to do with people making decisions with other people's money, I think that needs modification. The question that economists have asked themselves for a long time is, how do you explain these large disparities in wealth that we see in the economy? What has remained open and what's the question that we're now like waking up to, to address is, what is the link between the income distribution and the wealth distribution? So people have always treated the wealth distribution as sort of an appendix to the income distribution. So if the rich people get more income, then over time they will also get become wealthier. And the wealth distribution is just sort of like an appendix, a mirror image, if you will, of the income distribution. And our new research puts that into question in the following sense. What do you see is that across the wealth distribution, the portfolios that people have in equity, how much do they have in a bank account, how much, how, how much housing, or, or how big is their house, how valuable is their house, this distribution of assets is very different across the distribution of, of, the, of the population. So the very rich mainly have business wealth. That's, you know, Bill Gates and others, they're very rich because they own large stakes in businesses. Then if you look at what the middle class has in its portfolio, what the, what the middle class, a typical middle class household would own, would be mainly a house, mainly real estate. Okay, there's some cash maybe or some, some, some deposits in the bank and maybe there's, there's other, some other assets, pension assets, but the dominant asset in the middle class portfolio is a house. And then if you go like further down in the distribution, if you look at the bottom third, the main asset that people have is cash. So what this means is that when asset prices change, so example, the relative price of housing relative to the stock market, if the housing market does better or worse than the stock market, that will change the wealth distribution. And it will change the wealth distribution, it's what we show in our new paper, in a very substantial way. So the increase in wealth inequality that we've seen since the crisis has been the largest on record. And the main driver of that has been the very strong performance of the stock market relative to a more sluggish recovery of the housing market. Of course, there are markets, certain cities where housing has done very well, but generally speaking, stock markets have outperformed housing markets by a large margin, and that means that the top 10% of the distribution have done much better than the rest, and wealth inequality has really spiked in the last decade to a degree that we haven't seen over such a short period ever before. I think one very important implication of what our research has pointed out is that Economic policies, if you think about monetary policy, for example, we have to ask what, is the, what are the effects of these policies on asset prices. If you, for example, think that quantitative easing, monetary policy that we've done over the past decade has a, had a major impact on stock markets, and maybe because of the transmission, lower trans, slower transmission mechanism, or because of remaining problems maybe in the financial sector, the transmission of monetary policy into the housing market was much slower, you, what we see then are major distributional effects. People owning stocks do much better than people own houses. So the idea that monetary policy is somehow neutral and doesn't have any distributional effects needs to be reconsidered. How do we explain the sort of this explosion of debt, of financial sort of intensity of modern economies since roughly the 1970s? How do we explain that debt has risen so much and at the same time interest rates have fallen so much, which is another big topic that we're discussing. So a very attractive proposition is that what we've seen in the past 30 years is a form of a credit supply shock where there's just been much more capital, much more money available in the financial system to lend out and that potentially that increase in sort of available funds in the financial sector has a lot to do with growing income concentration at the top because uh, there are rich people at the top who get a big, big slice of the income pie and uh, don't know what to do with it. They can't consume it and they have a lower propensity to consume, so they save it and these savings have to go to some use in the economy. 
and uh, potentially like pushing down interest rates and then explaining both phenomena that we're witnessing, which are falling interest rates and rising debt.